important part through all kinds of aspects of your career as a medical or as a student, as a resident, uh, now on faculty. Um, do you think research should be uh, required for everybody, or was it just an important part for you and, a, and plays a special special role in the mentorship that you received? Well, research definitely played a special role in, in all my mentorship. I, I actually, when I went to medical school, I thought I would ha want nothing to do with research, but I got so turned on to it when I was a medical student, and then further as a resident, it's really been a joy to have the flexibility to look uh, at a project in depth and to study uh, physiology and then to get guidance on it when your thought processes might not be exactly the way they should be. I think that's been terrific. So it's been very important for me. But I think it's a, 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 a very important component of the training of all surgeons. Now, I don't know if everybody needs uh, to spend two years in a laboratory to do that. But I do think if you look at current training, right, what do the residents need to know uh, when they go out? I mean, I think they're going to need to really understand quality and outcomes and metrics. And um, they are now hospital employees um, to a large extent. And so they better understand uh, how they are being judged, the research behind that and they will be um, talking to very sophisticated and well-trained uh, hospital administrators. And if they don't understand research and how to interpret data, that will put them at a significant disadvantage. So I argue pretty aggressively for uh, continued uh, research. And in fact, I would say this is, a, this is a constant discussion at the American Board of Surgery. And um, I wouldn't say I, I, uh, I have a big following in terms of pushing the research, but there, uh, it's definitely an important component of, of surgical training. So you mentioned the differences in how surgery is going to change over the next couple of years. We're going to be judged more on quality, um, and many of our, our outcomes are, are quality-based. What other changes do you see uh, in the future of surgery in the next 10 years? Well, I think uh, the the changes in uh, you know being paid for value will drive a lot of the changes. So I think what we'll see is uh, people will be very careful about uh, um, assuming risk. They'll risk assess patients. That's great for the patients, uh, and um, and patients that fall out of their risk corridor, uh, they will probably seek uh, uh, other ways to care for them. And so I think that. Uh, this could drive regionalization of care. I think that it's unlikely that somebody in, even in a big community hospital, will take on very risky patients if it's going, going to affect their pay. And those patients will be transferred, I think, to university centers. And, and actually, I think that's a good thing for the patients, even though I understand that patients don't like to travel. Uh, in the end, it's about them getting the best care. And then I think we'll continue to see changes you know, in the technical approaches to, to cases. I think robotics, even though it's uh, the introduction of it, has been long and relatively um, expensive. You can see that the expenses uh, are starting to come down, and we see more and more papers published on uh, robotic hepatectomy. And I think the robot makes uh, approaching uh, some of the more complex operations uh, a little bit more difficult, a little bit easier. And so I think that, I think robotics will be a big part of the future as well. What about the care of the patient? Are we still going to be the triple threat surgeon who sees patients in the clinic, takes them to the operating room, cares for them afterwards, does the research and does education? Is that a feasible model in the future? Yeah, I don't think it's a feasible model now, actually. I, I think that you know, if a faculty member uh, for me is is doing well as a dual threat, that's great. Um, there are folks that do triple threat and do relatively well, but I think that that's going to become uh, increasingly more difficult. I think what um, what you could expect from a faculty member is to be a dual threat, but I think our patients will be assessed out side of our clinic uh, to a significant extent, and they'll be cared for uh, by hospitalists uh, or surgical hospitalists uh, to a significant extent. 
Um, uh, I think that surgeons obviously need to remain engaged in the care of the patients, but uh, the surgeons are going to be expected to spend their time in the operating room. It's just a matter of resources versus time, and surgeons' greatest value is in the operating room, so I think that's where you'll see surgeons uh, more in the future. So how do you manage that conflict with the patients being risk assessed, you said, in the clinic, um, without the surgeon being able to give them the eyeball test and, and becoming more of a technician? Yeah, this, uh, I think the eyeball test will go away, actually. And it'll be, you know, there'll be risk stratification and the anesthesiologist or the, uh, you know, the hospitalist or somebody will say, here's the risk with your patient. It'll come on an app on your phone, probably. And you'll have the preoperative risk assessment. And then hopefully you'll take data during the operation that will change a risk assessment score. So, you know, after an operation, uh, the risk of your patients for diseases like kidney failure, et cetera. So I think it will change a lot. These systems are already out there. People are trialing them. So I think that will only become more prevalent. Um, so, it, you know, in a way, we don't want to give up what we've been doing and caring for the patients. On the other hand, I think uh, serious resource uh, utilization will have to be constrained, and, and that, I think, will probably happen uh, to some extent to the surgeon. So, not only have you had a very successful career, you lead a well-balanced life, uh, you have a wonderful family. And uh, how, do, how do you balance all this? What's your advice to somebody, um, either a medical student or a graduating resident, a junior faculty, or a mid-career surgeon? Yeah. So I think you have to make time every day for what's important to you. If you don't include it in your daily schedule, it probably won't happen. So um, I try to uh, take, uh, make good use of my time. And things are, that are important, I try to get done right away in the, uh, early in the day. So my routine is to get up at 4 a.m. and roll out of bed and do my exercise. Uh, because uh, otherwise during the day I won't have that opportunity likely. Uh, so that's done early in the day and I think if we don't take care of ourselves, we're going to have a hard time taking care of patients, especially as surgeons. And I hate to admit this, but as I age, I feel every operative day more and more, uh, especially if you're doing long cases. And so I think that is really important, that you have to do that every day. And then uh, other uh, things that are important uh, outside of work, you know, obviously uh, my wife and my children and, and my habit is when I, when I leave the institution every day, I call one of my children. I have a 20-minute ride home. And so I talk to one of the kids uh, every day on the ride home. So usually, you know, a couple times a week, I talk to each, uh, each of our three children at least two or three times a week. And that, that keeps us in touch. Uh, and then, um, you know, I'm not as good uh, when I get home about, you know, staying off of the computer, but I try to devote at least uh, some time every night to listen to what's going on in my wife's life. And, uh, and so, uh, but, that, but I have a pretty limited life. That's what I do, right, is uh, I, I, I work out, I ride my bike, which is a, is a great joy for me. And, um, you know, I try to keep abreast of what's going on in my uh, children's life. But that's about it. It's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Any other advice for medical students, residents, faculty, or mid-career surgeons as far as, uh, as, far as career advice? Yeah, I think uh, the career advice is to, uh, you, you know, uh, roll with the punches, right? Because surgery is a tough uh, discipline. And so um, they're not going to be, uh, not every day is going to be great. So when, uh, when stuff happens, just kind of, you know, chalk it up to a learning experience and roll on and continue, continue to look forward uh, rather than behind because um, uh, there's a lot of great days ahead and you have to try to remember those. So for every patient that, uh, where the outcome is less than what you desired, think of the 10 patients that you've really helped. So again, looking forward, what are you most looking forward to in your new role as, as dean? Uh, well, this, this will be a, uh, an expansive role, and so there are many things, I think, to look forward to. I mean, I think one of the exciting things is uh, looking to, toward building an integ integrated uh, care delivery network across eight hospitals. Uh, that will be a, a, a big challenge, uh, but I look forward to working with people. At the end of the day, 
our job is really about relationships, relationships with patients, with faculty, with students. And so um, I think a great thing about this position will be I'll have many relationships with people ranging from students up to the most uh, highly trained uh, uh, physicians and, and uh, business people uh, and healthcare administrators. So I always enjoy meeting people, learning from other people. I'm sure I'll learn a lot. And actually, at my heart, I'm probably a learner. Uh, and, and I like that. And so that's probably what I'll enjoy the most. Mm -hmm.